Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Gregory Burke, and you're very welcome to this talk on attracting and retaining disabled talents and how to get it right. And um, we're just waiting for a few moments for uh, people to come in through the lobby. Uh, so we'll just hold fire for a few moments or two. Uh, but um, I just want to reiterate how very welcome you are to this access able talk on attracting and retaining disabled talent. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the clock to um, tick over to about uh, two minutes past 10. And then I think, because we're all busy people, um, we should make, make a start and the stragglers can catch us up. Well, there we are now. It's two minutes past ten, um, so I'm going to begin. Welcome everybody to this Access Able talk on attracting and retaining disabled talent. Thank you very much for joining us. I'll do some introductions in a moment, but to begin with, I'd like to just go over some housekeeping, please. Now, this uh, is going to be recorded, and the recording will be shared afterwards uh, by email. To to those who've signed up and on our YouTube channel. We'll aim to share this by the 6th of November. Um, your microphones have been automatically muted. That's because we've got a lot of people on the call. If you've got any questions or comments, please put in the chat and our team will be monitoring them and letting me know as we go through or towards the end. We'll be dealing with individual questions that come up in the chat at the end if we've got time. Um, now you can turn on your uh, auto captions by going to the more, the three dots, uh, clicking language, speech, and show live captions. Hopefully you'll know your way around that. And at the end of the webinar, we'll be asking you to fill in a feedback form, but I've asked that feedback form to go in uh, quite early on. It's a really important form for us. Very grateful for putting that in because it helps us plan what we're going to do in future sessions. So uh, my name is Gregory Burke. Uh, I'm an employment law and discrimination barrister working out of 7BR Chambers in central London. I've been fortunate enough to be listed in the Disability Power 100 for the last six years. I'm also the founder and chair of Access Able, and it's in those two guises that I'm speaking with you this morning. At Access Able, we're approaching our 25th year of operation, and to celebrate, we're launching three major initiatives. One is an Entrepreneur's Award for £25,000 plus 25 hours of um, free mentorship. So if you are a disabled person, you've got a wonderful business idea and you want some no strings funding and some help, then keep tuned to our website. We're also uh, produced a Your Accessibility Guide portal, which again is entirely self-funded and enables businesses across the UK to sign up directly for an accessible a detailed access guide and for disabled people to recommend venues that they'd like us to see uh, working with. And we're working with Visit England and Visit Scotland on that. And then finally, which is today, um, it's our uh, inclusive employment activity where I do talks like this, but also we have an initiative of enabling uh, disabled people to uh, get over the confidence gap and for um, HR professionals and people teams to be able to uh, feel confident in working with disabled people, making sure their recruitment processes are right and that they know what they're doing when it comes to reasonable adjustment. Um, so th those are really the, the two key barriers that we see businesses being prevented uh, by in recruiting disabled people and disabled people for applying for jobs. That number one, businesses lack confidence in knowing how to appropriately interact with disabled people, navigate reasonable adjustments, and therefore they shy away. And two, disabled people do not have the most basic accessibility uh, information to have confidence they can get to the interview space with dignity. And it's no surprise then that disabled people are almost twice as likely to be unemployed as non-disabled people, which is a tragedy and a missed opportunity for everybody. So in our 25th year, our mission is to turn that depressing situation around for the benefit of all. Now, for those of you who um, don't know, as Access Able is a 
disabled person owned and led business. We employ over 120 people with disabled people at all levels of our organization. We serve over 6 million people a year, helping them to access places and spaces with confidence and dignity through the provision of quality assured detailed access guides, which can be accessed free on our website, accessable.co.uk. And we also support organizations to improve the inclusivity of their current and future buildings through our inclusive design consultancy. We support people teams to upskill their colleagues on disability equality and uh, developing robust, inclusive HR practices through our e-learning program. Now, uh, like uh, most disabled people, I wasn't born of my disability. I acquired it out of the blue as a sportsman, 16 year old. I had severe encephalitis and uh, during the four year period, I was in hospital and rehabilitation, during which time I was washed, fed, uh, turned in the night. And as you can see, I've got an improving condition. But the reason that I tell you that quite personal information is that when I was in hospital, it was obvious that I had multiple impairments, but it was only when I was discharged that I realized I was disabled because doing everyday things were fraught with difficulty and frustration. Just really simple things like you know, trying to go to a, a chemist, for example. I, I was a full-time wheelchair user at that time. And I remember trying to push open this quite heavy door to get into a chemist and the doorway was just wide enough for my wheelchair to get stuck in. And there was a gentleman who was trying to come out, I had people behind me who were trying to get in. And my overwhelming feeling was one of shame that I was taking up space, that I was being a nuisance. And if we're not careful, these feelings and uh, a lack of uh, self-worth can, can really take root um, in us as disabled people. And I was just simply becoming more and more afraid. And I found that when I felt most disabled was when I turned up somewhere and was told there and then that I couldn't come in or I needed to go through a different route that separated me from the party that I was with. So what we wanted to do at Accessable was change this massive, great big confidence barrier for disabled people. And for the first two years, we conducted um, a consultation of disability groups all over the UK, over 100 groups face to face. Why is it that we're not uh, in education more? Why is it that we're not in employment more? And what came back from that exercise was that one, society in general is largely inaccessible. And two, in a generally inaccessible society, there could be venues and services which are accessible to my own individual needs or your own individual needs if only we knew about them. Um, and so what we've done over the, the last quarter of a century is work with over 1500 groups of disabled people to define and refine a survey methodology that captures fine grain information about access into and around venues on a genuinely pan disability basis that embraces the texture and richness of disability and what people need to know about being confident in going into a space. And for the last 15 years also, we've worked collaboratively to support organisations on their accessibility journey, providing inclusive design and some um, e-learning developed with clients from the start. So it works for them and reflects the lived experience of disabled people. Today, we serve a diverse range of partners from SMEs to global organisations on their accessibility journey. Partners as diverse as Gatwick Airport, TUI, Marks and Spencers, Next, nearly all UK universities, over 100 NHS trust and local authorities. And our approach, which we'd like to share with you briefly, is uh, looking at three main areas three main barriers that disabled people face. Number one is information. Is, the, is there information about how I get into and around your place of work, for example? Are you telling people how they can come in for interview? What's your welcome like? 
when we approach any unfamiliar area of life, we necessarily approach it with stereotypes we already possess. And some of those stereotypes can be exceedingly unhelpful. How are you uh, training and mentoring your, your colleagues to, to welcome disabled people, to manage disabled people and to, to identify talent and promote disabled people? And then finally, space. In order to attract and retain employees, accessibility and inclusivity must extend beyond the recruitment process. Disabled people need to feel included and comfortable in their physical working space. So how are you addressing your work and assessing your workplaces and how are you addressing the required improvements? So those are the, the three main areas and that concludes the introduction to Accessable. And uh, hopefully now you'll see the basis of authority from which we're talking about in terms of, ac of accessibility and disability. And you feel comfortable that we'll be able to serve you in looking at how we can help you uh, bridge the confidence gap to enable disabled people to apply for jobs with you and for you to feel confident in disabled people uh, coming to work. So let's have a look at this now and start with what do we mean by disability? Well, uh, it's a good question and um, we've had lots of good questions and the this session is going to be focused on addressing those questions that have been submitted to us in advance so thank you for that we've had some great questions and we aim to cover as many of your questions as possible during this talk if you have other questions please pop them into the chat and if there's time for questions at the end i'll certainly take them i should say that none of the advice none of the legal advice that i give you today constitutes formal legal advice. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because every case turns on its own unique facts and circumstances. And there's no substitute for seeing a lawyer who can take the time to understand all the unique factors of your case. But I'm going to cover uh, lots of themes and questions in my talk. And one of the challenges of doing a talk like this is that you're addressing a very wide audience. Some of you are from HR, some are not. And uh, some of you will know a lot about disability and, and others are uh, beginning their exploration. But I hope there'll be something for everyone. And for the more experienced, if we do cover familiar ground, think of it as welcome revision. Um, and I've deliberately tried to limit legal jargon and phrasing to make the talk as accessible as possible. And I'm not just going to give a legal perspective here. This talk is a fusion of uh, my experience of working in the disability sector for 25 years, of leading a large business for that length of time, and also working as a specialist uh, employment barrister. So there are some legal perspectives here and some pragmatic business perspectives too. So let's start by being clear on some concepts. Disability, what is it? Um, uh, how widespread is it? Uh, what do we know about it? Well, first of all, there's the, the size of disabled um, uh, population. Disability can happen to anyone and there's the statistical probability it will happen to one in six people in the UK. There are 16 million disabled people in the UK and nearly 5 million carers according to the Department of Work and Pensions. One in four households are impacted by disability. The disabled pound the estimates vary from 249 billion that you've seen there. Others put it as high as 274 billion. It's the purple value of the purple pound. There are over 1.3 billion disabled people wor worldwide, 17% of the global population, with a worldwide disposable income of more than $8 trillion. And for something that is so widespread, uh, disability really needs to come out of the shadows to be seen for what it is, which is a mundane, ordinary, day to day, and it just needs to be catered for. But at the moment, it's not being catered for. Only 4% of disabled people in a survey that Accessable did of over a thousand people um, last year in this, only 4% of disabled people felt non-disabled people understood the barriers that they faced. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we can uh, help uh, help ground ourselves in what the law considers to be uh, disability. 
And that's found in the Equality Act at 2010 at section six. This is our friend here, the definition of disability, which is a person has a disability, if they have a physical or a mental impairment, which has a substantial and long term adverse effect on that person's ability to carry out normal day to day activities. And the Act protects anyone who has, ha has or has had a disability according to this definition. So it's important first off to understand, just as we did the size of the disabled population, to understand the breadth of the definition of disability. And some things just to flag up here, some impairments and an impairment is um, to use uh, colloquial language is, is like uh, you've got a problem with something. It might be with your hearing or with your mobility and some impairments are deemed disabilities. Some conditions are deemed disabilities in the Equality Act, which means that you don't need to look at uh, any further into the Act to make a judgment about whether somebody uh, falls under the protection of Section 6. So if you have somebody comes to you in an interview, for example, on your workforce who is blind or has a severe sight impairment, for example, or a severe disfigurement or um, uh, cancer, a HIV a diagnosis, a multiple sclerosis, they are already covered by Section 6. You don't need to have a look at whether it's a substantial adverse effect or it's day to day. But let's have a quick look at substantial effect. And here in this example is John. John has epilepsy. He takes medication which completely controls his impairment. But if he didn't take medication, his epilepsy would not be controlled and it would have a substantially adverse effect on his day-to-day -day life. But even though his medication controls his, dis his uh, epilepsy, he is still considered to have a disability because the law considers what you'd be like without the medication or without the um, mobility aid, for example. We look at long term. The Equality Act 2010 protects disabled people and, and those who've had a disability in the past. So here in this example, Shyla has had a mental health problem. Um, it's had a, a substantial and long term adverse effect on her ability to carry out normal day to day activities. But she's experienced no recurrence of this condition since she had it. Let's say hmm, she had it 20 years ago. But if in the employment sphere um, she was uh, to apply for a job and she accounts for the gap in her CV, for example, as um, uh, being um, uh, attributable to the fact that she had a, a, a severe episode of depression and she was discriminated on the basis of that, then she would be entitled to protection under Section 6. Just going to create a little bit more space here so I can put my papers down. Bit more easily. OK, so I hope you're all with me so far. Um, and and if if we uh, then have a look at um, what happens with direct disability discrimination. Now, this happens when a disabled person is treated less favorably than a non-disabled person because of their disability and when it cannot be lawfully justified. And there is um, uh, in, in direct discrimination, there's a whole range of disability discrimination. Direct discrimination cannot be um, objectively justified. And if we are to attract and retain disabled people into our workforces, we need to ensure that we are creating a non-discriminatory environment. And this again is, is multifaceted. Let's have a look at an example of direct discrimination. So here, Anna has a job interview. She refers to having depression in advance, a bit like Shiloh perhaps. Um, and although she's the most qualified candidate, the employer does not offer her the job. Now, this decision treats her less favorably than the successful candidate who's not disabled. And actually, it wouldn't matter if she was disabled and had something else. The fact is that Anna has been discriminated against on the basis of her disability. She'd have a claim under Section 13 of the Act. She'd also have a claim under Section 15 of the Act, which is discrimination arising from disability, if there was something in the interview process itself which gave rise. But you can see here that that's a clear example 
of discrimination, but there are less clear cut examples of it. In this example, Alan is caring for his disabled son and he has to take time off work to take his son to medical appointments. OK, the employer is not happy about this um, and after a while dismisses him. Now, that dismissal may amount to direct disability discrimination against Alan because of his association with his disabled son. Let's look at another area where um, an employer might fall down. Adan applies for a job as an administrator. At the interview, the interviewer sees a multiple sclerosis sticker on his notebook. And he thinks, oh, Adan has got multiple sclerosis, he's got MS. And he hasn't told us he's got MS. Um, and um, I, I think he does have MS and I'm not going to offer him a job because of that. Even though Adan performed best at interview, he doesn't get the job. Um, and so that would too be discrimination. But why should you bother? Why isn't it OK for um, discrimination to, to happen anyway? Well, you've got the legal obligation. Um, but even if you were to put that to one side, you've got a fantastic opportunity when employing disabled people. And some employers might think, well, this chap's just gone through three or four slides about how I could be liable for disability discrimination. Therefore, I don't really fancy employing disabled people. Thank you very much. I'll keep my risk down to a minimum. Well, let me tell you that every single person you employ has a protected characteristic under the Equality Act 2010. And for those of you with large HR departments who I work with day in, day out as an employment barrister, you know that um, a great many people who are uh, on your active files do not have a disability. The fact of the matter is you can't hide from the law, but you can educate yourself about it. And most of the time that I'm in the in tribun employment tribunal or in court, it's for a claim that need never have been brought if the employer had just um, had some uh, a good understanding of the legal landscape and the legal landscape exists whether you actively seek to employ disabled people or not, because we've seen how big the, the, the size of disabled population is and the likelihood is that you're employing more disabled people than you think. And this is why Access Able has developed a support program for employers, which I'll touch on at the end of this session. But then there's this hugely positive case for employing disabled people. First of all, it's a it's a first hand window into a market that's worth 250 billion. A study of HR managers who accommodated the needs of disabled people rated their performance as average, above average or excellent in 72 percent of cases in a recent study. A further academic study in 2012 found workers with and without a disability had comparable performance in 18 of 31 locations. In the balance of that 18 to 31, where differences of productivity were found, workers with disability were more productive in 10 of those locations and only less productive in three. Who has more absences, workers with disabilities or workers without? workers without. 6.5 absences compared to only three absences per year for a disabled worker. Disabled people are less likely to leave. When an employee leaves an organisation, you know this if you work in people teams or you manage your own business, there's generally reduced activity, reduced productivity before departure, before that person leaves. Then you've got the hiring costs of having a replacement employee and other transitional costs. Disabled employees are more likely to stay with you and employers therefore incur higher turnover costs with non-disabled people. And a report by Accenture in 2018 found that in the US, companies which work successfully towards disability inclusion also realised tangible financial benefits. So the leading companies were on average twice 
as likely, twice as likely to have higher total shareholder returns than those of their peer group. On average, 28% higher revenue, double net income, and 30% higher economic profit margins over the four year period. Pretty good um, business reasons for you to take to people who in your own business who might need persuading. Now, here are a couple of uh, questions that were raised um, in advance. Uh, what are the biggest challenges disabled employees face in the workplace? What steps could you advise to identify and support an inclusive environment? Well, both very good questions, and let me address those in these slides here. But let's address the scale, acknowledge the scale of the issue. Only 32% of disabled people felt that the disability awareness of others was good or extremely good. So people's attitudes and knowledge of disability has a big part to play in here. And the fears from disabled people and the challenges are, you know, if I apply, I won't get the job I want, I won't get the same progression opportunities, I won't get the support that I need from my manager. In fact, I'll probably get less support and I'll face discrimination or alienation from my colleagues. So a big part of attracting and retaining disabled talent is about creating the right culture, addressing the fears of disabled people, but also communicating to disabled people that yours is a workplace where uh, disabled people are included and their value truly So these issues are, oops, have I done that on the right? Can I, can I get into the building? Am I going to be treated seriously? Is there a working culture where my disability is going to hold me back? And then there's the confidence barrier of the people interviewing. Am I going to inadvertently offend? Am I going to do something wrong? This person is talking to me about reasonable adjustments. What does that even mean? Well, let's have a look at that now. Reasonable adjustments. Well, reasonable adjustments is a duty that applies to all employers. Uh, all, it, it engages all disabled workers of an employer, any disabled applicant for a job for that employer, and any disabled person who's told the employer that they may be an applicant for a job. I was thinking of applying to you. Um, it, in the employment tribunal, very often there's a dispute about whether the person has a disability or not. Um, and my advice to you is that in most cases it is really obvious, sometimes you know, really obvious. I can't believe it when uh, either I'm acting for a claimant and the employer is saying that the claimant doesn't have, an, have, have a disability, or when I'm acting for the business and the employer, and the employer is trying to explain to me in, in confidential uh, meetings before we, we go into court that this person doesn't have a disability, when it's absolutely obvious they have. If someone's coming to you saying they need a reasonable adjustment, first of all, don't worry about whether that person meets the niceties of Section 6 of the Equality Act. Um, think about it in a different way. You've got someone who's coming to you who um, is saying, look, I've got this problem or I've got, I've got this difficulty. Um, and we all know that in managing people in the workplace, all good managers try to, to maximise people's strengths and minimise their weaknesses. That's like, you know, line one of chapter one of how to manage people. And here you've got someone who's volunteering. They've got a problem here and they need your help. So have a look about it in that way. We were also asked when we were uh, putting this talk together about whether um, you can ask for a proof of disability. Well, if someone's asking for a reasonable adjustment, they're saying they have a disability um, and then they need to put their employer into a state of knowledge about that so they need to disclose what their disability is um, and they can do that first of all by telling you and then by giving you a selective um, uh, uh, range of their medical records so you don't need to see everything that's got nothing to do with what they're talking to you about but a selective range of the medical records or a letter from their GP 
or they could agree to go to occupational health and uh, see the doctor there. If they fail to do that, then you as an employer have just got to do the best you can do on the knowledge that they've given you. Um, and um, if it is not as good as that person wants, then really they've only got themselves to blame because uh, they haven't given you uh, all the information and the employment tribunal is often very sympathetic to an employer who's in that position. So reasonable adjustments um, are, are grouped under three main areas. And I should really point out that reasonable adjustments are considered so important in the Equality Act that it is seen as the cornerstone of that legislation. And put simply, it's a duty to, to make reasonable adjustments requires employers to take positive steps to ensure that disabled people can access and progress in employment. And it's all employers are subject to that law. And so this simply goes beyond treating disabled workers or, or job applicants or potential job applicants unfavorably, just saying, well, I'm not treating anyone badly because they've got a disability. That does not cut it, I'm afraid, not anywhere near. Um, it means taking additional steps to which non-disabled workers or non-disabled job applicants would not be entitled to. And failure to take those additional steps may well turn out to be discriminatory. So the law is organised into three main headings. You can see here policy criterion or practice, which is known as PCP, physical feature, generally the removal or amendment of, or the provision of an auxiliary aid or service. Um, PCP is not defined in the Act, but it generally means a requirement to do something. And I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, physical feature, removing or altering it, that could be any feature of design or construction of a building, any feature of an approach to a building or exit or entrance from a workplace, that would be covered in physical feature. And provision of auxiliary aid, um, that would be uh, something which provides support or assistance to a disabled person um, who would otherwise face a substantial disadvantage. And that could be a specialist piece of software, uh, an adapted keyboard, um, or even the provision of a sign language interpreter. Okay, so that those are the three basic areas, PCP, physical feature, provision of an auxiliary aid. So let's have a look at those in practice. So here is um, a physical feature adjustment. Alina has a, a visual impairment. Clear doors, obviously a danger for her. Um, she might just walk into them. So placing stickings or markings on the doors may prevent this and it's low cost. And that's a real feature generally of reasonable adjustments. Reasonable adjustments tend to be no cost or low cost. It, that's not something that the majority of employers need to be worried about at all. An example of a PCP um, might be, remember that's like a re requirement. It could be that a company have a policy, a requirement, um, a rule, that only senior employees um, have a guaranteed car parking space. But you may have an employee who comes to you with a disability who's got limited walking capacity. Um, giving them the uh, a car parking spot uh, that's further away because they're not a senior employee um, is not going to help them. It's going to be discriminatory on the basis of their disability. But giving them a car parking space where the senior employers park because that's the car parking space that's right next to the door, that would be a reasonable adjustment. An auxiliary aid example, another example of that might be um, an instruction manual put into easy read for someone with a learning difficulty, for example. But those are some examples of reasonable adjustments. And when do I have to make them? Well, the duty to make adjustments is where remember those three, the PCP or the physical feature or the absence of an auxiliary aid puts a disabled person at a substantial disadvantage compared with people who are not disabled. And the Act says a substantial disadvantage is one that's more than minor or trivial. And really that is a, is a pretty low bar, okay? So, as an employer then, or someone in the people teams, what should I be looking at? How should I be thinking about this 
reasonable adjustment duty. Well, first off, look at your um, recruitment processes. Where are you advertising? Is it diverse? Review your job descriptions to ensure that they obviously they're accurate, but you're not asking for unnecessary skills, uh, for example. Um, you know, if it's a sedentary job, do I really need to have a, a clean driving license? And as it happens, I'm not allowed to drive, um, but I can do um, a desk job. Look at how you provide information uh, on your job. Um, could you do it via videos as well, for example? Consider giving a guaranteed interview to a disabled person who meets the necessary um, job criteria. Don't get trapped. And I see this so often. Don't get trapped into thinking our standard application process is X and I can't do anything else because you can. You could provide and accept information in accessible formats such as email or braille or easy read or large print or audio format where this would be a reasonable adjustment for you to do so. And you need to think ahead perhaps and prepare your team to react for a request for a document um, in an accessible format quickly. And in doing so, you'll then be able to allow the candidate to have their application considered at the same time as other applicants. If you can't do that, let's say someone comes out of the blue and says, you know, I need this application in Braille and it's a reasonable adjustment for you to do so. And that will be dependent upon all the facts. And I'll come on to why some requests for an adjustment aren't reasonable. But let's say you're asked for information in Braille um, and it's going to take you extra time to deliver that. D don't keep the job cutoff date the same. You'll then need to um, uh, extend that window so that the person who um, has requested the information in, in Braille or whatever format it is that you don't currently have to hand has got sufficient time to make a good application and won't have been put at a substantial disadvantage waiting for an accessible application procedure. OK, so that is the um, uh, first stage of the recruitment process. But at the application process itself, look at how you can offer reasonable adjustments here. And on this slide, you've got four ways that you could do it. Um, you could allow disabled applicant to take a verbal test rather than the written one, um, allow them to be assisted, uh, allow extra time to complete a test, provide instructions in alternative formats. So far, so good. One question that we've been asked is, why can't a disabled individual be offered a job on the back of a strong CV? They might not be good at interviews, but they could prove themselves in the job. So thank you, that was your question. This is a major problem for uh, many people, particularly people uh, who are neurodiverse, the whole interview structure itself. Now, the CIPD have produced some really good guidance and they did this in February of this year and they highlighted the risk of neurodivergent applicants being confused or feeling rushed by assessments or tests. And they uh, have recommended a whole range of different assessment methods such as work trials or practical assessments or mini apprenticeships. Now that all of that is really good. Um, what I would say is that the length of time that a trial lasts should be that which is um, reasonably necessary for you as the employer to assess an individual's ability to do that job. And the reality is in all but exceptional circumstances, an individual undertaking a trial that's lasting more than one day at the very least is is likely to be entitled to the national minimum wage or national living wage. Um, Microsoft, interestingly, uh, found that they weren't getting the best programmers um, in uh, in their promotion uh, process because they did that via an assessment and they had many applicants who had uh, declared autism. So what they did was rather than have an hour long assessment, they now do an assessment week and they've had a huge. So that's 
something to consider that this is not just for when someone applies for a job, but when someone is in work and seeking um, a promotion too. Let me check the time. OK, interviews. Look at where you hold the interview, uh, provide information about the space. Um, do that as standard. How do I get into the interview space? Actively ask about reasonable adjustments. Look at how you score the candidate. Look at how you train your panel. Um, these are, are really I I important aspects. You can see on the slide there of the importance of objective scoring and avoiding irrelevant interview questions. Just focus on the focus on the job, focus on what's needed to do the job. Now, in terms of giving information about space, in a recent survey that Accessable did with a, a thousand respondents, 95% of people said they felt anxious before visiting somewhere new. Nearly nine in 10 expected accessibility information to be on the venue's own website, and three quarters of people didn't attend because they couldn't find out about accessibility. So to encourage someone to interview with you and to feel confident in disclosing their disability to you, being open and transparent is key and giving very practical information about how to access your your interview space is really is the most basic first step. And you want this to be detailed, factual, trustworthy information and cover all of your space. And if you imagine if we think about what it was like for you when you um, went for a job interview and whenever we go to a job interview, we always feel nervous. We always want to be liked and we always want to feel that the person interviewing us will think that we're competent and we're the right person for the job. But you can time that anxiety by a thousand if you, you're thinking of, well, you know, where am I going to park? What's the surface of the car park like? Am I going to be able to manage that particular type of surface? How far do I walk? When I get to the entrance of the building, um, which way do the doors open? Are they heavy? Are they, are they light? And are they going to be wide enough for me? How far do I have to go to the reception desk? How will I be able to walk that distance? What's the lighting like if I rely on lip reading? Is there a space for my assistance dog? Is there a pattern on the carpet that might trigger by neurodiversity, might give me a migraine, for example, or might make me fall over if, if that affects my neurological condition? Um, if I need to use um, the lift, will I be able to get into it? What are the dimensions? Is there an audible announcer if I um, uh, rely on that. Um, where's the toilet? <laughs> Will I be able to use the toilet? Um, what's the transfer side if I'm a wheelchair user? What's the transfer space? Will I be able to get into the room? Will I be able to get out of the room? And so on. Providing good quality information really is the absolute basic first step. And here's what we've done uh, for National Trust. Let me just a couple of slides here because the, the guide itself is pretty detailed. Information. Um, about where the place is located, photographs, which builds people's confidence, lowers anxiety, which so many of uh, the job seeking generation have. Um, and then taking you through the entrance, a logical journey, combining factual detail and uh, measurements, large photographs, which help to visualize the space and you can make your own assessment of the pattern on that door that's adjusted for you, for example. And then providing information about toilets is obviously particularly vital. And getting data that serves a range of conditions is absolutely key. Don't just focus your information on wheelchair users only. Such a small percentage of disabled people are wheelchair users only. We're a very important um, uh, constituency of disabled people, but it's not the, the whole picture by any means. Remember when you're recruiting that there are very few situations where a question about a person's disability or health needs to be asked. So focus on the person's ability to do the job with reasonable adjustments in place if necessary. Now, I did say to you a few moments ago that I, I would talk to you about how to turn down a request for a reasonable adjustment. Well, when can you do that? If it's a reasonable adjustment, you can't. Well, you can't do it. You can't turn it down lawfully that you can only turn down an unreasonable adjustment. Adjustments are either reasonable or they're not. But there's a range of factors that will help you um, uh, consider whether it's reasonable or not. 
So the first, perhaps the most important is, is the step proposed um, for the reasonable adjustment, say the reasonable adjustment is software, is provision of that software, does that stand a chance of reducing the substantial disadvantage that's faced by the disabled person in the workplace? It doesn't, the adjustment doesn't need to guarantee it's going to um, remove that substantial disadvantage, uh, but it must have at least a chance. Is it practical for me to provide this? What's the financial cost um, compared to my turnover? And what's the extent of my financial resources? And even if an adjustment has a significant cost, it may still be cost effective in overall terms. Remember what we were talking about before, about the cost of you know, somebody leaving and uh, reduced productivity and then the cost of rehiring and then training them up and all the rest of it. So it might be cost effective, even though it looks like a chunky cost to begin with. Although we need to remember that most reasonable adjustments are really low in cost. Um, what's the availability to me as an employer of other financial sources? I'll come to that. Um, and then what's the type and size of the employer? If you're a public sector employer or a large employer, you might well be expected to make adjustments that smaller employers would not be expected to make. We were asked whether there's a threshold between what an employer is required to do under the law and what it should consider in addition, such as best practice. Well, the key is that reasonable adjustments are a floor, they're not a ceiling, and there's no definable threshold where you pass through from uh, making a reasonable adjustment to best practice. But in my chambers, 7BR, uh, we operate out of an 18th century townhouse. It's absolutely vast. It's like, like going in through Doctor Who's TARDIS's front door. Um, and going into that 18th century townhouse, there are three steps up. And the reasonable adjustment was for a receptionist to come out with a ramp, uh, help me and open up the door and what have you. But what that didn't allow me to do was work at any point where the receptionist wasn't working. So outside eight to six, I, I couldn't work in chambers really. Um, and the remedy that chambers decided upon was um, the installation of a sesame steps lift where the steps in the townhouse retract, a, 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 um, a platform lift comes up, um, I'm able to get in and then the steps come back and the facade is as beautiful as it was um, at the very beginning. Now that adjustment cost over a third of a million pounds. Now that very definitely is best practice. Um, that's going well beyond reasonable adjustment, but um, it was a, a wonderful thing to do for me, for future uh, barristers, for future uh, people who wanted to work in chambers, but also it's very important for access to justice for any person who is coming to our chambers. So all in all, a truly wonderful thing to do. We were asked um, if reasonable adjustments are not offered, how would an applicant or an employee take action? Good question. And then uh, is being able to work from home becoming recognised by law as a reasonable adjustment? and uh, is an employer acting discriminatory if they don't do it? Well, two good questions. The first question is, so let's address that first, that the employer, or the employee rather, should, uh, if they want a reasonable adjustment, write out in a letter to their manager why they need to have that adjustment or meet with that manager and explain why. Um, because uh, the 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 employer needs to know. <laughs> Secondly, the employee is not under a duty to come up with a solution. It's enough for them to say, I've got this particular problem in this workplace that is because of my disability uh, compared with people who are not disabled. I need uh, help. Have a meeting with HR or um, the manager, have a note taker um, and see whether you can work out an adjustment between you. If an adjustment is not forthcoming, then you as a disabled person uh, can take advice from a range of free law clinics. There's the Bar Pro Bono Unit. There's the Citizens Advice Bureau. They can give you advice on how to bring a claim in the Employment Tribunal. There are no costs in the Employment Tribunal, even if you lose. So unless something is extremely amiss in how you brought the claim, a downright lie or an abusive way that you've conducted proceedings, um, if you even if you lose, you won't have to pay the costs of the employer's 
lawyers, barristers and what have you at the Employment Tribunal if there's nothing, if you've acted truthfully and conducted yourself properly, then there'll be no cost for you to pay at all. So that's the route for question one. Question two, working from home is a potentially reasonable adjustment right now, um, depending on the circumstances. If you're a, a heart surgeon, working from home is obviously not going to be a reasonable adjustment. But if you're doing a job that could be done at home and there's a substantial disadvantage for you being in the office brought about by your disability, then working from home is likely to be considered a reasonable adjustment. Now, the support that's out there for employers is uh, access to work. It's a government scheme that can help with extra costs, which might not be reasonable for an employer to pay. Um, Google access to work for doing that. And once again, most reasonable adjustments are low cost and low cost. So that's access to work. Um, now then, we've got some time for just a few questions um, that we've been asked about how employers can support their managers um, and how do you support disabled talent in, with career progression? Well, let's revisit just for a moment the powerful business case for employing disabled people. Um, getting it right for managers, getting it right for disabled people helps to avoid upset, optimises the contribution uh, a person makes, avoids the declining contribution, keeps that person in work, helps that corporate memory of organisation too, often underestimated, avoids the cost of recruitment, and so on. But um, as an employer, you want to support your team, your manager, in being confident and knowledgeable. And you can see here all the different worries people have from upsetting the person, getting the language wrong, struggling to understand an impairment. And often what I see in tribunal is the claims coming about from well-meaning discrimination, which are basically born from assumption about someone's ability or capacity to manage others or to travel, for example. So talk to the disabled person, talk about what they want to achieve, um, talk about what their strengths are, how they see their um, their uh, career progressing. Um, it's about helping disabled people have visible um, leadership uh, roles, leadership models, and maybe consider a disability staff network. See the person, it might sound hackneyed, um, but it means that um, uh, it, it, it doesn't what it doesn't mean and seeing the person doesn't mean avoiding disability because disability can be a huge positive um, disabled people have great problem solving skills. It might a disability might have helped that person's ability to empathize, for example. So uh, but it does mean seeing the person does mean seeing the person as a whole, what their strengths are. Um, and. Just because something hasn't been done in a particular way before. That's never a reason why it can't be done now it, it, or, or, or there can't be a change to that so that a disabled person doesn't have to um, uh, bear that disadvantage. There's, there's always room to innovate and always room to grow. Goodness me, well, we have uh, covered an awful lot of ground and uh, with uh, five minutes left, um, what are the key takeaways? Well, the key takeaway I'd invite you to have a think about is number one, the absolute, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the absolute bottom of that pyramid is providing detailed access information to your offices and work environment. If you're not even giving that most basic information, what are you doing? Support managers on disability awareness and where they stand in legal obligations. We can't expect managers to understand all the intricacies of employment law and, and uh, disability awareness. Remember that the law is based on reasonableness. If an adjustment sounds reasonable, it probably is. If an adjustment sounds unreasonable, then it might be. It, it merits investigation. There's a powerful business case for in expanding the talent pool, as we've seen. See the whole person, see how Disability can be a great positive too. Employing disabled people, trying to make yourself more disability inclusive as a business is an example, number one, of doing the right thing, but also is an example of how 
doing the right thing morally and the right thing commercially go together. And they often go together. So I do wish you the best of luck with um, uh, what you're trying to do. We can help you if you would like that. I've talked about our um, our mission and what we're trying to do in our 25th year. In our inclusive employment offer, we can help with providing the access information. We can help with um, employers and people teams having a greater awareness of disability and having e-learning training, which uh, helps them understand about reasonable adjustments. I've written that with um, my experience of what I see so often in the employment uh, sphere, as well as combining it with lived experience of myself and, and many, many other people too. So we offer a detailed access guide to head office and two e-learning packages, one disability awareness training for all staff and two, the manager's training course. So that's uh, a solution for large businesses, but we also have a scalable one for smaller businesses too. Um, that's me done in a nutshell. Um, we've got a feedback form, which we'd be ever so grateful if you filled in. And now I'm, I'm gonna be told by my, um, team whether there are any questions in the chat. There's someone who wants stats on um, disabled people as employees. Um, if you email into us, I'll give you those uh, directly or I'll put it into the email that's sent out with the with the video if that's easier. Perhaps I'll do that. Um, and uh, and finally a reiteration from us if you kindly fill in the, the feedback form. I'd be ever so grateful. Um, as there are no questions, um, and I I can see my chief executive, and she's going to give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. Thumbs up if there are questions, and thumbs down if there aren't. There are no more questions. So may I thank you for um, being here. I can see there are still 91 people on the call. So hopefully you found the call um, uh, interesting and informative. We've covered a great amount of information at, at, at some speed. Um, but you can get this as a video and I wish you the best of luck in employing disabled people and um, helping your business go from strength to strength. And if you're a disabled person watching this, best of luck in your employment journey. And whoever does finally get to employ you, they'll be fortunate to do so. Thank you very much. And um, we'll see you again next time we do something like this. Thank you and bye bye.